All right, everybody. Well, thanks for joining me uh, on this Sunday afternoon. Uh, quite a few of you, uh, actually, at the moment. Uh, maybe not too surprising, given another uh, very active pattern with uh, some unusual aspects to it, uh, especially tomorrow with the potential tornado threat in the Central Valley. I'll talk mainly about that in this abbreviated uh, live office hour today. Uh, but uh, I also want to talk about the, uh, the other piece of the storm uh, that's coming in earlier. This is, uh, all in all, still looking like a pretty strong storm for most of northern and central California. And there will be a risk of flooding later, uh, starting really this evening and into parts of Monday. Along with that unusually elevated uh, threat of severe thunderstorms and even uh, an isolated tornado or two, uh, in the, the Central Valley, particularly in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, and I was going to show you some satellite imagery, uh, but right now it looks like uh, the, the, one of the primary websites that I use to do that is down for emergency maintenance. So I'm actually currently uh, trying to see if there is uh, a better option to show because this is a pretty, okay, I can, uh, I got something here. Um, what I really want to show is that this is this is a pretty remarkable looking classic winter storm, but more interesting in some ways than its overall size uh, is uh, the fact that it's associated with a lot of thunderstorms. There are a whole lot of thunderstorms out there over the Pacific Ocean right now associated with this broader scale storm system, and that's a sign of some potentially unusual things to come tomorrow and later this evening. Uh, so maybe uh, I, I will start with that. I just want to uh, emphasize to everybody that I'm probably going to have another live session tomorrow. Time is yet TBD, but it will likely be somewhere around 2 p.m. Pacific time because I'm trying to time that session with the, the sort of the, the most active period for Central Valley thunderstorms tomorrow because uh, I'd like to take folks on a a radar and satellite tour with potentially tornadic thunderstorms. That is not something that uh, we get to do often, at, at least with predictability in California. There are essentially at least a couple of tornadoes somewhere in California every year. They're usually weak and sometimes they spin up without a lot of warning and they're usually not super disruptive. Tomorrow uh, has some potential to be a bit more than that. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I'm highlighting it, because we haven't had a tornadic pattern in the Central Valley like this, at least in a number of years and perhaps in over a decade. So this is a significant potential event there, particularly given that this will center uh, on areas that have uh, more substantial population centers than sometimes is the case for Central Valley tornado outbreaks. This one may well extend into the Sacramento area uh, or the Stockton-Modesto corridor, or even in the northern San Joaquin Valley, although the primary threat looks further north. I'll dive into that in just a couple of minutes. But first, uh, I just want to start with, uh, I'm going to start with the radar. I'm going to share that on screen, and so you're going to see that momentarily, uh, because there is some active weather coming into the Bay Area uh, as I speak. Nothing crazy right now, uh, but it looks like it's about to get a little bit more active. So this is, uh, this is again, this is radar out of San Francisco. So this is from Mount Amanum in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, you can see some scattered showers, locally heavy ones are starting to pop up over uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains right now, sort of popping up in place. So again, we're not looking for a huge mass of very heavy rain offshore with this system. This is another one that may fill in with showers and thunderstorms as it gets closer. Uh, kind of like all the folks who thought that the last big storm in early January, early February was a big bust because uh, they had to wait for all these spiraling bands of showers and thunderstorms to fill in. This one may be similar. Again, not expecting nearly as strong of winds with this one, so I don't expect to see the level of wind damage or disruption uh, or power outages. But locally, there could be some strong winds. And the bigger concern actually with this one is with the rainfall and the moderate flood potential and then somewhat unusually with the severe thunderstorm and even tornado risk in the Central Valley tomorrow. So there's, uh, this is sort of in the warm sector uh, of the system. I don't know exactly, I don't know the surface analysis, but somewhere uh, there's a cold front sort of like that and there's a sort of a warm front nosing north somewhere across Northern California and the cold front is somewhere way back out here. Again, not defined by a super tight frontal band 
Uh, but that's the general setup. And once again, this means that warm, moist air is being evicted from the south uh, across the region. So it's quite mild across this section of California right now with all the cool, warmer air coming up from the south. This is not going to be a low snow event. Uh, there should be, unfortunately, snow levels will mainly remain above uh, Lake Tahoe level. There will be, again, Sierra cement at very high elevations, but this I don't think this is going to be the event that really gives you the totals that people have been wanting down at five and 6,000 feet. So uh, it will be a big Sierra storm at the passes, but not so much below the passes. Uh, but this really, this, this is a storm where the, and I'm gonna zoom out a bit just because I can draw on this map. Uh, of course, the whole storm is not visible on radar view yet. Uh, now I'm zooming out to all of California where this radar has no coverage. But I mostly just wanted to use this map to draw on because the main flood risk from this event is probably uh, sort of in this region of California. So we're talking about the, uh, without getting into the geopolitics of what the central coast is, the uh, most of the central coast, so probably up as far south and including Santa Barbara County and maybe Santa Barbara itself, uh, northward along the central coast, San Luis Obispo County, Monterey County, Big Sur coastline could get a pretty good uh, intense uh, downpours with this as well, and including both the Monterey and San Francisco Bay areas up into Mendocino County, and then also uh, a good portion of the Sacramento and, and northern San Joaquin Valley uh, with this. Uh, and that roughly corresponds with where the Weather Service has issued a flood watch uh, for that large portion of California. This doesn't look like a really high-end flood event, so the worst case scenario here is not as bad as the earlier February event in terms of extreme rainfall and widespread, uh, potentially serious flooding, as was the case in Southern California during that event. But there is, on the other hand, uh, a chance of more widespread flooding farther north than during the last event. So while I wouldn't expect it to be severe flooding, more of the you know, rapid rises on creek streams and small rivers, and some of them will probably spill over uh, their banks, causing some problems and some urban flooding. You never know, because soils are saturated. This system does have highly convective uh, pieces to it. In fact, you can already see there's sort of these, these you see these little uh, line segments of convection that are here offshore. These are the kinds of things that could produce gusty winds and locally torrential downpours when they come on shore. So they don't look that impressive yet, but these are likely to intensify as they get closer to the coast. And there's probably going to be more bands of showers and thunderstorms like that to come from way offshore. And so uh, I think that um, there's a lot more uh, where that came from and it's going to get a little rough out there in some spots. Although again, I don't expect any 90, 100 mile an hour wind gusts out of this. Uh, or even in most cases, I don't even really expect to see many 60 to 70 mile an hour wind gusts. I think we're mostly gonna stay below that and so the wind damage should be a lot less. So this does not look like a major damaging windstorm, although it will be windy, there could be some isolated power outages. Uh, with the exception of the potential tornado threat tomorrow, it's a bit different, I'll talk about that separately. But overall, uh, the system is moving in overnight into the morning hours in Northern California, and then will progress, progress southward into Southern California. There is some flood threat as far east, perhaps, as Los Angeles County, mainly because things are so wet uh, there already, but the rainfall from this event is likely to be significantly less than the last one. On the other hand, the thresholds for uh, mudslides and debris flows are also a lot lower than they were going into the last event because, again, of the historic level of rainfall that fell in some parts of Southern California. So sort of taking that uh, two notches down because it's going to be a significantly less intense storm down south, but maybe taking it one notch back up again because of these unusually wet and saturated um, antecedent conditions. So overall, maybe one notch down, but still a pretty significant storm with, with widespread risk of at least some moderate flood conditions and your mileage may vary. Some places may end up in a bit of a precipitation donut hole because this precipitation is going to be a little bit more convective and less stratiform, so a little bit more patchy, but locally very intense. And also there's potential upside if you do get caught under one of these really intense convective bands and it sticks around for a while, well then you actually might see significant flood risk in locally. Uh, we're talking like a like a 50 mile, mile wide band or less. There could be a couple of spots either in Southern or Northern California that get stuck under a stalled uh, convective element, or, or, or in Southern California's case, the, the, the weak to moderate atmospheric river, though it will be weak to moderate, it will be slow moving Monday into Tuesday, and so it could potentially drop a significant amount of rain once again. So 
Flood threat not as high with this one as in early February, but it is still significant and elevated in some places and also extends farther north uh, into the Bay Area and a bit north of that into the Central Valley uh, than it did with the last one. Wind threat is considerably less everywhere, fortunately, so that is less to worry about, although it will still be windy. And again, there is the very conditional isolated wind threat in the Central Valley tomorrow with those severe thunderstorms. I'll talk about that in a moment. So here's the radar. The radar elsewhere doesn't really look that interesting yet because the storm is still offshore. Let's see if I can bring up and share the satellite imagery instead because that gives the wider view. So bear with me for a moment as I pull that up. All right, so here is the full disk satellite view uh, that I wanted to show folks. And really what you can see is uh, this big honking storm offshore. Uh, it's another big one. In fact, this one is a lot larger than the early February storm in the sense uh, that it is, uh, in the sense that it is not as compact and the low pressure center is less uh, uh, concentrated at its middle point. Sorry, sort of a bit of a brain fart there. But the point is, uh, is that this system, you know, one of the reasons why the winds won't be as strong with this event as the last one is because the pressure gradient is spread out over a, a wider area, much wider area, at least two to three times the distance for the same change in pressure. So of course that leads to a much weaker pressure gradient and lo much lower maximum winds. Although it's, it does broaden the area of winds, so there's gonna be a big surf along the coast generated by those broader areas of strong winds offshore. But overall, weaker winds, but in some ways, slightly higher impact because this is a bigger storm and a slower moving storm. This is not going to move through quickly. Uh, and what you can see, as I mentioned offshore, all of these elements, if you look at the cursor, each of these little subswirls within here are pretty strong little clusters of uh, mesoscale vortices, uh, essentially spin within the spin. You can kind of see the broader cyclonic gyre here with all of these, maybe a dozen little spinny features within here those are all little small convective complexes, showers and thunderstorms, some of which are pretty strong, uh, that are in a very unstable environment by California and North Pacific standards. I once again think this is being amplified by the fact that the ocean surface temperatures remain, as they have been all winter, significantly warmer than average. And we've seen significant thunderstorm activity, including some severe thunderstorms, with almost every storm that's moved in since October in California. And this one is going to be no exception. It looks notably intense. Uh, another interesting feature is, see this roll cloud that's extending almost from about Marin County down to the Pacific Ocean, way west uh, between Hawaii and Ensenada. That, that's, that's a contiguous roll cloud that's going all the way. So that in itself is probably not super uh, significant weather, although it might be associated with those little brief torrential downpours we saw on the radar earlier, but it's an indication of a, a pretty discrete uh, and lar uh, p uh, axis of convergence near the surface, if you will, so that we do see that from time to time. But this is a particularly impressive one because it's essentially unbroken for at, it's at least a thousand miles, I would say. So we'll see. Uh, it may even go off screen a little bit. Uh, let me see if I can pull up uh, an overlay uh, with some uh, lightning data because there has been, at least there was overnight, quite a lot. Uh, and I just want to show that here. Uh, yes, okay, so you can see, it's a little bit hard to see perhaps if you're on a small screen, but all of these blue flashes here, and there are some of them all the way back down to here, but especially up in this region, uh, there's quite a few flashes ongoing, and this is actually less than there was last night, but this may pick up again overnight and certainly into tomorrow. This whole area of unstable air is going to move into Northern California tomorrow, and that's going to be the catalyst for some unusually high risk of some potentially severe thunderstorms later tomorrow. So uh, just to pull over, I want to show uh, some, some model data here, uh, checking in on folks briefly just to make sure there aren't any issues with the, uh, uh, with the stream. Nope, looks like it's going uh, better today, so that, that's good to see. Um, okay, going back, uh, you're just seeing the same thing, but I'm bringing up uh, this modeling here. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit uh, on tropical tidbits. Uh, yes, uh, so this is what I wanted to show here. Well, maybe I need to zoom out a little bit so I can navigate the page properly. Okay, I think that's good enough. Um, 
So what we've got here is just like last week, uh, another, uh, this is actually old, let me refresh this. Okay, this is from when I wrote the blog post on Friday. Here's what we have, here's the jet stream level winds uh, in the corner. Uh, uh, you can see the units on the screen. Uh, these are the jet stream level winds. Uh, and you can see that right now, this is what's happening, uh, is this jet streak is nosing into Southern California. So this is quite a strong jet streak. Uh, again, just like last week, but notice that surface low is much farther away. So, uh, sorry, not last week, but two weeks ago, the early February event, this low pressure system was, was like right just west of San Francisco. So you can see how it's much farther west, not gonna bring as big of wind impacts, and also not as deep, not quite as deep, but the, synop the overall synoptic pattern is similar. This very strong jet streak putting central and northern California in a favorable region in the left exit region. Uh, the left exit, so the exit region of the jet streak is where the jet streak goes from strong to weak. So you can see it's strong here and weak here. So this is the exit region. And left, of course, it's left relative to the flow. So the flow is like this. You can see the streamlines of the arrows from left to right, or roughly from west to east across the screen in, within that arc. So left is left of the jet, so left of the jet is here. So this is the left exit region. That is favorable for upward motion in the atmosphere, difluence, and even divergence at upper levels, meaning that the lower levels of the atmosphere uh, essentially experience convergence, air moving together, because the air is being uh, moved away uh, from the center, uh, central axis at high elevation. So essentially, uh, when you're in a favorable region for developing storms or significant storm activity, you get upward vertical motion in the atmosphere. And often there are several things that can facilitate that, but one of them is uh, air converging near the surface and air diverging uh, well above the surface. So you can imagine it's sort of a three-dimensional column where air is inrushing towards the bottom and outrushing at the top. The opposite is true for high pressure systems, which is why you get downward motion and few clouds. You need upward motion for cloud storms and precipitation and downward motion for the opposite of that. All of this means that because of the curvature and because of the horizontal and vertical wind shears here, Northern California is going to be in a favorable region for large scale uplift tomorrow. In addition to that, it's also going to be in a region of very moist and unstable air, thanks to that air mass offshore with some colder air coming in aloft. That is a pretty favorable pattern for severe thunderstorms, and it's not one we see very often over Northern California. In fact, it's very much reminiscent on a smaller scale of a pattern we might see over the central U.S. Uh, in the Great Plains during a tornado season. So not expecting a Great Plains level magnitude outbreak by any means, but there are elements that are similar, and this will be potentially a significant event by California standards. I'll get into that a little bit more, but let's just move through, folks through the storm itself, as you can see, this jet streak weakens, but it, as the axis changes, it remains uh, really oriented in Southern California into Tuesday morning and even into Tuesday night before moving away, uh, which means that this prolonged band of precipitation, even though it may not be as intense as the last one, it could cause some flood problems because it's gonna stick around for a long time. Here's what that looks like. Here's the precipitation. Green is rain and blue is snow as modeled. As you can see, initially, Precipitation this evening starting off mostly as rain, even at high elevations in California. So this is not gonna be a lot of snow at the outset. As you can see, as you go through the overnight hours, heavy rain throughout most of Northern and Central California at times, snow levels lowering a bit, but still on the higher side and really remaining pretty high tomorrow. In fact, you know, it, it's very possible we stay mostly rain at lake level. Uh, but this is, uh, this is about 6 a.m., 8 a.m. tomorrow. This is closer to noon. You can see by noon, the contiguous rain has moved on, is mainly now affecting Ventura, LA counties, and the Sierra, where the Northern California is in this more showery, patchy regime. However, it fills in in the afternoon. So look how we go from drier to wetter again as we go from about noon to 5 p.m. All of that precipitation is coming from thunderstorm activity across Northern California, and that's quite a bit. In fact, you can even notice some very intense uh, convective elements up the north end of the Sacramento Valley, up by Lake Shasta even, so up in the foothills up there, uh, and continuing into the evening. So you can't tell a lot from that, but look at what happens also, uh, direct your attention towards Southern California. So again, this is uh, early this evening, this is tomorrow morning, the heavy rain, it weakens as it goes over LA County, kind of. but then look, there's this second wave that comes in with the subtropical tap across Orange and San Diego County. So it doesn't look as persistent or as extreme as the last event, but it does have a lot of structural similarities and there could still be some significant flooding 
down south if there, it, this does stall out for a prolonged period of time. Colder air on the backside of the system, better chance of Sierra snow, but by that point, there's not going to be a lot of precipitation around. So uh, unfortunately, again, I don't think there's going to be a great accumulating uh, snow accumulating storm at lower to medium, moderate elevations, although it will be up at 8, 9, 10,000 feet, as has been the case for much of the winter. And after that, we get another break. Uh, this storm may or may not stay offshore. This is a week out. I'm not going to talk about that today. But what I do want to talk about today is this. So uh, what we've got is a pretty interesting setup in terms of uh, severe thunderstorms tomorrow in California. And by interesting, I mean one that could actually have a higher likelihood of affecting people's day-to-day -day life more than the usual very isolated uh, severe thunderstorm in a remote agricultural part of the Central Valley, which might harm farmers within a few, few square mile area, but really is largely invisible to the rest of the population. This might be a bit different. This is the official risk outlook for severe thunderstorms. Uh, forgive the ads. This is, you know, this is what happens when I use uh, third party sites, which I'm grateful for, for having around. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit one more time to make sure that you can actually see the labels here. Again, now this is Pivotal Weather, another, uh, another website uh, that I go to for, for uh, model data and others. So uh, the, the, this is an outlook from the Storm, Storm, Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. They are responsible solely for severe convective weather, meaning intense thunderstorms and associated phenomena like large hail and tornadoes, as well as certain kinds of fire weather forecasts. They don't do any other predictions. It's a specialized center located in the heart of Tornado Alley, but of course it's a NOAA center, so they do stuff nationally. Usually we don't look at their products in California because we don't see a whole lot of severe thunderstorms in this part of the world, but this is one of those exceptions. Uh, and the the name of uh, the, uh, and you can kind of see at the bottom here, uh, the units are, these are qualitative categories uh, where there's no likelihood, where there's a less than 10% chance of thunderstorms, you get white, which is none. Uh, you get a light green, but there's at least a 10% chance of thunderstorms, but they're unlikely to be severe. You get a darker green if there is a quote unquote marginal risk of severe thunderstorms, which really means about a 5% chance or so of, uh, of, of severe thunderstorms in the dark green area. But then you start getting into brighter colors with the yellow being slight risk. Slight risk uh, is a little bit understated. It's, it's, it's essentially, you know, on, on, on a scale of one, two, three, four, five, where five would be like a catastrophic a tornado outbreak uh, somewhere else in the, in the Eastern US, you know, the yellow, the slight is two on a scale of five in terms of the, of, of the likelihood of severe thunderstorms. Uh, and that is nothing to sneeze at in California. Slight risks are, where, are rare uh, west of the Rockies. Uh, and in particular, here's something that's interesting. If we look specifically at the Storm Prediction Center tornado probabilities, these are notable. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see a 2% a risk, which again, 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's the, the uh, it's really a question of whether there's likelihood of a tornado within 20, I believe it's 25 miles of any given point. So the likelihood of there being a tornado somewhere within a 2% area, it doesn't mean that it's 2% in the whole area. It means it's 2% per, uh, I believe it's a 25 mile radius. So the cumulative likelihood is actually somewhat higher than that. And then the brown here is where there's a 5% chance. Uh, of tornadic activity, uh, and we don't usually see that contour, especially two days in advance, or I guess one day in advance, this is day two, but at full, more than 24 hours in advance, we don't usually see that high of a risk categorization. That means that there's at least a 5% a chance of a tornado within any given 25-mile uh, radius with any point within that brown area. That is, you know, it still means that if you're in any given place, you're unlikely to experience a tornado, but it does mean that somewhere within this region, there's a pretty good chance of a tornado or two uh, tomorrow. And look at where this area actually is. So this includes uh, really the heart of the, the Central Valley, and it extends all the way north to the northern end of the Sacramento Valley and south a bit into the northern San Joaquin Valley. But the main core of the risk here it includes essentially all of Sacramento County. So Sacramento itself, Davis, uh, Marysville, that whole corridor, along with Stockton and, and uh, Modesto, I believe maybe they're either in the two or 5%, I don't know exactly where they are on the map. My point is, uh, this is a fairly heavily populated part of the Central Valley. 
Sometimes uh, we see tornadoes in the Central Valley that only people, uh, you know, five or six farmers will witness or anybody who happens to go on a California style low stakes storm chase might see. This is a day where there might actually be some tornadic activity closer or even within uh, more populated uh, cities and suburbs in the central Sacramento Valley and up to and including the I-80 corridor between the Delta and the lower foothills. Uh, now, there is some uncertainty. I've seen some, ana some surface analysis suggesting that the higher risk of tornadoes may actually extend farther north into the North Valley due to topographic influence, and that is plausible given some known topographical convergence uh, scenarios where uh, essentially what you have is a strong wind aloft from southwest to northeast, sort of in that direction. So you have winds going from southwest to northeast at high elevations, then you have veering winds uh, that at surface elevations, because the air comes through the Golden Gate and through the Cartina Strait, for example, it then the valley spreads out. That wind tends to then flow up valley from south to north or even from southeast to northwest. And so then if you have winds from southwest to northeast at high levels and winds at low levels from uh, south or southeast to northwest, that's almost a 90 degree difference in the wind direction. So the vertical wind shear is almost a 90 degree angle different at the surface and at higher elevations. And in particular, it, do it doesn't work so well if the wind shear is reversed. If the winds at high levels were from the southeast and low levels from the southwest, well, that isn't quite as favorable as this pattern. Why is that the case? Well, because you have warm, sunny air gaps in the clouds down in the San Joaquin Valley, warmer place, moister air, that's going to get advected under colder air up, the, up to the north. Uh, so that, 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 that warm advection, that moisture advection is going to make the atmosphere more buoyant near the surface. And that colder air aloft coming in at upper levels is going to make the atmosphere more unstable from the top down. So you actually have increases in instability, uh, both from what's going on with surface processes and what you have what's going on aloft. And so that is somewhat unusual for all of those things to come together. If you look at some other hazards from the Storms Prediction Center, there's a, there's a slight risk of some large hail, although that's lower than the tornado risk, which again is unusual in California. And there's also a slight chance of just straight line damaging wind gusts. It is unusual that of the three hazards that the Storm Prediction Center uh, forecasts for, tornado, hail, and wind, that the highest risk tomorrow is actually of tornadoes. Uh, and again, this is a notable event. There's no guarantees. I'm, I'm not a severe weather meteorologist primarily, but this is the kind of pattern where I would not be astonished if the Storms Prediction Center later tomorrow issued a severe thunderstorm watch or even potentially lower likelihood a tornado watch for portions of the northern San Joaquin or Sacramento valleys tomorrow. I've been going back in the archives, still asking some folks uh, around. Uh, California does occasionally see uh, severe thunderstorm watches, uh, but it rarely, very rarely sees tornado watches. In fact, I believe the last one may have been all the way back in 2010 in the Central Valley. And before that, I honestly don't have the data yet. I hopefully we'll have that by tomorrow. But the reason I bring this up is California actually sees tornadoes every year. Uh, this is a widespread misconception that tornadoes don't happen in California. They've been recorded, I believe, in almost every California county historically. And in some cases, there have been dozens of tornadoes recorded in certain counties. The Sacramento Valley is one of the tornado hotspots in California, such as they are. Partly because on the right kind of days, like tomorrow, they do res it does resemble in some ways a mini Great Plains, uh, similar to both the, the gradually upward sloping topography of the Great Plains and the occasional co-occurrence of wind shear and surface-based instability, again, as we'll have tomorrow. The other uh, mini tornado alley in California is, a is actually down in coastal Southern California between the Central Coast and San Diego County. And that is where we have seen already two significant tornadoes this year in California. These are the two that made landfall along the central coast and had path lengths of, of, of five or more miles each. Those are significant tornadoes by California standards. We could see something like that or even maybe a bit more than that tomorrow. And although California tornadoes tend to be on the weaker side, mostly compared to their uh, Midwest counterparts, by far most tornadoes in California are either EF0 or EF1 on the enhanced Fujita scale, going from zero as being the weakest with tornado speeds up to about 80 miles an hour and uh, EF5 with really just being an almost inconceivably catastrophic tornado with winds sometimes exceeding 
250 or even 300 miles an hour, there's a 0% chance of that happening in California. So just to be clear, uh, but you know, even uh, EF0, EF1 style tornadoes with winds of 80 to 115 miles an hour, that's nothing to sneeze at and that can cause significant damage and potentially injuries if they occur. There have been a handful of stronger tornadoes than that in California historically. Uh, I believe there's been something like five or six tornadoes ranked either EF2 or EF3. And once you get up into that category, those are genuinely life-threatening and can cause a lot of damage if they go through a populated area. That's at the very upper end of what's been observed historically. I'm not saying that's something that's likely tomorrow. I'm just saying that, generally speaking, California tornadoes are on the weaker side, but that's not true 100% of the time. And someday, there is at least the chance to have a more significant tornado event somewhere in a California city, and if it happens, it would likely happen on a day like tomorrow. Again, not saying that it's likely tomorrow, but saying that, of course, since the odds are usually zero, uh, the non-zero odds to know tomorrow are notable. It is worth noting that one of the strongest tornadoes in California history is arguably not, not technically a tornado, but was in fact a fire-generated vortex on the car fire, which reached uh, wind speeds equivalent to an EF3 tornado. Uh, with wind speeds essentially around 150 miles an hour, that terrifying vortex of uh, superheated gases and flames which uh, bent over high-tension power pylons and apparently uh, rolled uh, extremely heavy multi-ton bulldozers, firefighting bulldozers, over during that catastrophic fire event back near uh, Redding in 2018. Although that does not technically qualify as a tornado for the record books. So uh, a little piece of... Uh, tragic uh, historic trivia there, uh, but that the potentially the strongest cal uh, tornado in California history may have been, in fact, generated by a wildfire rather than a severe thunderstorm, even though they do share notably many structural uh, similarities. That fire generated a, a pyrocumulonimbus cloud that did resemble in many ways a traditional severe thunderstorm. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about the meteorology uh, tomorrow about what's going on. Uh, and uh, let me just pull up uh, some other products here. Uh, I need to go back to uh, models, and I need to go back to uh, this guy. All right, so uh, looking at the some of the severe weather metrics, let's take a look at, say, most unstable CAPE. CAPE is an acronym uh, that stands for Convective Available Potential Energy. Uh, and really what it is is an aggregate measure of the potential instability or the up, up, really the strength of updrafts. The higher the cape, the stronger the potential strength of updrafts, updrafts being the, the upward moving air, the sometimes violently upward moving air. Uh, in the strongest thunderstorms, updrafts can be over 100 miles an hour, so you don't want to fly through that in an airplane. Uh, and so aircraft do, do very actively avoid these, these features in the atmosphere. One of the reasons why your plane frequently gets rerouted if you're uh, taking off or flying through storms across the central of the country during tornado season. Uh, but essentially, it's an aggregate measure of atmospheric instability. In the Midwest, during tornado season, you might see CAPE of anywhere from about 1,000 to four or 5,000 on an extremely unstable day, but usually between about 1,000 and, and 3,000 uh, joules per kilogram are the units. In California, it's unusual to see CAPE much above about 500 joules per kilogram, and that itself is often enough to generate significant thunderstorm activity. But uh, look at what happens tomorrow. Uh, this is late morning. This is getting close to the noon hour. And on the eastern side of the Central Valley, we see CAPE that's up above 500 joules per kilogram. It's, uh, in fact, it's up into the 600, locally 600 range, 730, so it's getting some pockets of a much higher CAPE. But then look at what happens right around, uh, I'm sorry, that wasn't right at noon, that was about 10 a.m. This is, this is getting closer to noon now. Look at what happens, higher, Cape uh, well above 700, and here's Sacramento County. Uh, look, looks like there was a pocket of uh, 856, so you know, getting close to 1,000 joules per kilogram. That is significant by California standards. And you can sort of see in this, this dark gray area, the units are down lower if I, uh, if I scroll down. Um, this is a pretty broad area. This roughly corresponds with the region of enhanced tornado risk tomorrow from the Storm Prediction Center, and this is likely why. Uh, and don't take this too literally. You know, there could be other pockets. I mean, here's another one around 1,000. Here we are a little bit before the noon hour. 
uh, as we get closer, look, uh, as it ele elevates even further, we start seeing some pockets uh, above a thousand. So these are these are high values for California. Much of Sacramento County is up around a thousand. So right around noon, things get quite unstable, particularly the eastern half of the Central Valley uh, from about Butte County southward into the northern San Joaquin Valley. And as the afternoon goes on, that instability spreads northward. So we start seeing less instability down here, but more up here. Here's just north of Sacramento. Uh, well, you know, this again, this is a very this is very unstable by California standards, up around 1,100 joules per kilogram, and this expands northward in the North Valley as the day goes on. You can see that, that this is about mid-afternoon. We have pockets of quite high cape by California standards all the way from the northern San Joaquin Valley, now extending all the way up into the northern Sacramento. And also, not as high, but still significant cape across portions of the North Bay. San Francisco North Bay up uh, into the into, into the hundreds, five, six, seven hundred joules in Mendocino County. Severe thunderstorm risk is lower here, but not out of the question. So there is at least a slight chance of some severe thunderstorms North Bay, Mendocino, but by far the greatest likelihood will be in the Sacramento Valley. And this continues. This is now late afternoon. Again, seeing these pockets of greater than 1,000 uh, joules per kilogram of Cape extending all the way north. Uh, and now, you know, as we get towards 4 or 5 p.m., this is a pretty broad region, you know, we're, we're between 500 and 1500 joules per kilogram, the whole, really the whole valley. Uh, that's a significant prolonged period. And we can see again, pockets remaining quite high as we get to sunset. Now you're gonna see this fade away and disappear almost completely uh, a couple hours after sunset. So the severe weather threat pretty much goes away in the evening. So there could be some ISM scattered showers and thunderstorms around as you see offshore, three, four, 500 joules, but the the risk of severe weather and tornadoes pretty much goes away once the sun sets because that sun is providing some of the surface-based instability for these storms to get going in the first place. Let's go backward a bit though because you don't just need instability in the atmosphere for severe thunderstorms. That is a prerequisite, but so we've checked that box. Uh, let's take a look here. But what we also need is uh, essentially, uh, let me see here, we need some wind shear. And although in this map you see, of course, the wind shear is strongest down by where the jet is, uh, there is still a decent amount of it up in the severe weather region. So you don't necessarily need a lot. You just need enough uh, when the atmosphere is sufficiently unstable, and it looks like we'll have it. Here, as I mentioned earlier, are those southwesterly winds aloft. Uh, let's see what else I've got here. Uh, storm relative helicity, this one is a little bit misleading because it's showing purple values up above the mountaintops. So this is a little bit hard to deal with in enhanced topography. So let's see if I can, no, no this one's not that much help, helpful. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, all right, so we want some uh, hodographs, not a term that we usually hear in California. These, this is essentially showing rotation uh, at different levels of the atmosphere, the curvature of the winds. So here, up here, this refers to the elevation. So this is the zero to one kilometer winds direction, the one to three kilometer winds, three to six kilometer winds, and six to nine. So essentially, from purple to yellow, hopefully you're not colorblind, I apologize if you are, uh, you see the curvature of the winds, meaning that how much do the winds veer, uh, change direction with height. And this is what is interesting. Because, let me take, uh, so this is a little bit too early in the day. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so this is right when the, you can kind of see the cape in the background plotted, with the hodographs on top of them. Here's when things start to get unstable. And look at what these look like. Right around, this is Sacramento, it's just north of Sacramento. Over a thousand joules of cape. And look at that. There's a nice little hook in that hodograph. So as you ascend with height, the winds at low levels are coming, you can kind of see, southeast to northwest, as I said, along this axis. But as you go up to around even just one to three kilometers up, it's going almost a 90 degree different direction. So that is a pretty striking hodograph in terms of there being coincident surface-based instability, uh, strong curvature of the winds with height that is favorable for thunderstorm cells to start to rotate. Supercell thunderstorms, as they are called, are called so because they rotate and are able to maintain their strength because the updraft is occurring in a different location than the downdraft. 
if you just get a pop-up thunderstorm that you get this big explosive cloud, it looks pretty, and then it starts raining right where the updraft is, it'll kill itself off. Those aren't severe thunderstorms. Those are pop-up popcorn type showers and thunderstorms. But when you see a hodograph like this, along with surface-based instability, you can get storms that become self-sustaining. That's, that's why they're called supercells. And this is actually, I'm just looking at this for the first time right now, uh, today, and these are, these are striking. So let's see what happens later in the day. I mean, this is even more pronounced. Look at that hook. Uh, and again, it's coinciding with some of the strongest uh, surface-based instability. And uh, down here in the, uh, the eastern uh, San Joaquin Valley, still a pretty good hook, although not quite as much instability. So that's, again, probably why the Storms Prediction Center has at least a slight chance of tornadoes down that far south. And again, as we go, I mean, these are this is pretty striking, and this is just north of Sacramento. Uh, these are just sample plots, by the way. I mean, I, I, I'm betting that right over Sacramento, the, the, the signature would look similar, although there is a little bit of a difference Part of this is because of these surface winds coming in through the Cartina Strait and shifting north. So I would expect that from the I-80 corridor northward might be the best shot, although there is also some convergence down here. But this area right here, I mean, this is this is about as favorable a hodograph as I've seen in, in, in this part of California in recent years. So some genuine tornado risk tomorrow. Uh, it gets a little bit murkier uh, here. Uh, no, no, that was just a blip. It, you know, this is we go towards sunset again. So if you want to see some very interesting clouds, and if you're living just north of Sacramento, there's a decent chance of seeing some pretty uh, intense thunderstorms and maybe even a tornado or two tomorrow. I'm not, this, uh, for reasons due, due to topography, it's possible the models are underestimating the risk up in this region in the North Valley. So there is probably at least a slight chance of some tornadoes all the way up through Red Bluff Redding. But again, this risk really does look to be highest along an axis right along the I-80 corridor and just north of it, including Sacramento County and just north of it. So this could be uh, a little spicy tomorrow, and this continues again just until past sunset. So that is quite something. Uh, and so let's see here. Uh, let's see if there's a... Well, let's see, let's see if it's... Uh, showing any really strong rotational elements in the valley here. I'm just looking for my own. So I wouldn't expect this model necessarily to get it, but there are there are a few uh, updraft helicity maxima in the valley. So anyway, a little bit too early to pinpoint uh, the details, but uh, that looks like a pretty significant event tomorrow that is unusual for California. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. You're going to see, or I'm sorry, I'm going to share my face again. You're going to see me. Uh, I'm going to talk some more. I said this would be a short session. It's not a short session. It looks like we'll be another hour. Uh, so uh, I'm going to take a look at the questions. Uh, just want to remind folks before I look at the questions that I am going to try and do a lot, another live session tomorrow right in the middle of what could be, you know, a, a mini tornado outbreak. Uh, in uh, the Central Valley of Northern California. So I'm gonna time that, or probably, I'm guessing right now, I'm gonna put that on the books for 2 p.m. I'll do an announcement when I'm done with this, but I may shift it forward or back a little bit depending on what pops up. If there's something popping up earlier, I might be on earlier, but I should probably be on at 2 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow regardless. One thing I did wanna add is that I don't think this is necessarily an event that you know, should freak people out greatly. It's more of a meteorological curiosity with the caveat that if there is a tornado, you know, in a more densely populated part of Sacramento County or somewhere near there, that folks aren't used to that kind of risk. So the Weather Service will be watching closely. Uh, the Storms Prediction Center will be watching closely. The Weather Service in Sacramento will probably be the main entity uh, responsible for any tornado warnings during this event because it's pretty much their entire county warning area that would be potentially affected tomorrow. So keep an eye out to uh, for tornado warnings uh, from from them. Uh, they may be issued tomorrow. Keep an eye out for a tornado watch from the Storms Prediction Center. And by the way, this is a good uh, opportunity to reiterate the difference between a watch and a warning from the National Weather Service. A lot of folks saying there have been many tornado watches in California in recent years. There have not been. In fact, there have been zero because tornado watches, uh, the graphic that NOAA now uses to differentiate between watches and warnings, the, the, the sort of the funny ha-ha graphic is 
uh, a photograph of a cake ingredients, so all the ingredients that you'd need to bake a cake, just sitting out on the counter, uh, but not mixed together and not baked. Uh, that would be a cake watch. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the uh, weather service would be inclined to issue a cake warning once the ingredients are mixed together and the cake is about to come out of the oven. Uh, that is probably the most visual analogy uh, that makes a sense uh, in terms of uh, the difference between a watch and a warning. Watch is when there is at least a conditional risk and it's not imminent, but it is uh, potentially coming in the near future. Uh, and the... Uh... All right, looking like I'm having some connection issues again. Uh, let me know if you see it on your end. Uh, I am noticing it a little bit on my end right now. This is important for me to know because Xfinity is now claiming that everything is perfect uh, and it is clearly not. So um, I, we may need another pressure campaign. <laughs> I do have a better path toward talking to folks at a high level, but they've so far not solved the problem. Uh, it is ongoing. So if you're out there, give me a call. Um, sounds like I'm going to be spending yet another day on the phone trying to get Xfinity to deal with their equipment. Lovely. Um, so that's the difference between a watch and a warning. The other thing I want to point out is that folks are not familiar with tornadoes generally in California. Uh, and uh, although all tornadoes are potentially dangerous, generally speaking, you don't get the same sort of uh, town leveling events in California, even on the worst days that you can get genuinely in the Midwest. Uh, but still, take warnings seriously if, if they occur. And, the bigger risk, honestly, during events like this is usually lightning. Uh, more In California, far more people have been injured or killed from lightning than from tornadoes over the years. And of course, all thunderstorms potentially uh, can uh, cause a lightning strike near where you are. So that is actually the far greater risk. So if you do go out to storm watch or take some photos, uh, be careful. Don't stop in the middle of the road uh, and be wary of lightning because honestly, that's the probably the greater hazard than the tornadoes out there. Uh, whenever I go out to look at storms, I'm actually much more concerned about, well, A, other drivers, and B, uh, after that, it's the lightning. It's not really the tornadoes or the storms themselves, for the most part. Uh, because lightning, of course, is even more unpredictable than any other weather feature. It can strike many miles from the storm center. Uh, you can even be in blue skies and be struck uh, by lightning, uh, although the risk is lower. Uh, but at least a tornado, it's not magically going to teleport itself five or ten miles away in about two seconds. But that's effectively what you can do with a lightning strike. All right, I'm going to take a look at some comments, and then I'm going to go deal with the internet service provider again. Um, let's see here. Yeah, some folks reporting uh, some heavy downpours already with the storm so far, that makes sense. Uh, a number of folks are advising people to avoid trees near parks, near storms. Well, yes, I mean, that's generally a good good advice. I try not to, you know, personal experience. If it's windy, if there are wind gusts above about 20 or 30 miles an hour, I try not to be under trees because it doesn't even necessarily take extremely strong winds to bring down you know trees or big branches if there's uh, if the tree is unhealthy or if you're particularly unlucky so this is generally good advice i don't think that the wind damage from this or the wind risk is as high as the last storm by any means but it doesn't mean it's zero and some of the storm trees may have been weakened in the most la recent round of storms so even the lesser winds this time could bring down some additional branches beyond what you'd normally expect Oh, let's see. A few folks commenting that they have had their, their, their run-ins with California tornadoes in the past. And I mean, that's not surprising. You know, they do occasionally happen in California. Uh, and this part of the, the state, the Central Valley, is definitely one of the ones where, uh, one of the places where uh, that would uh, be expected to occur.
All right, so some folks are commenting that they're seeing video freezing occasionally, but the audio is fine. Um, that is, okay, now I just got a, a bitrate warning, so uh, meaning that the, yeah. Um, all right, so that that is, uh, all right, here I go with Comcast again. I, I swear, if I had a, if I had a, if I had the ability to spend as much time on other things as I spend on the phone with Xfinity and Comcast, life would be better. But isn't that always true? All right, so I am gonna I'm gonna call it a session, but I did want to send a couple of reminders. Thanks again for your patience. I'm gonna be unhappily calling the internet service provider again, but hopefully this doesn't happen tomorrow. Um, and even if it does, uh, I, at least it is usable right now. Uh, it, there should be no lag for the amount of money that I'm paying and the equipment that I have at this point. There should be absolutely zero lag ever, but uh, even if it's like this, I will, I will still try and power through it tomorrow. Um, but I will. I plan to have uh, again, as I mentioned, a live session probably around two p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. I'll, I'll make an announcement, but I might end up showing up early, so check that out uh, because I want to be online when the uh, when the oh, when the um, storms are picking up in their uh, intensity right around between between about eleven and and uh, three p.m. at some point. So. Uh, time TBD, but I will be on tomorrow, probably more than once, at least for a little while. And we may be looking at some tornado, uh, tornadic storms in the Central Valley. So um, stay tuned for tomorrow. There could be some significant uh, heavy rainfall and some flooding as well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, the, the call, the conversation. Uh, but there will be... Um, not super high flood risk, but some overnight into early tomorrow in northern and central California, and then a little bit later into Tuesday in parts of southern California, though not as high as before. But one of the big ones is going to probably be uh, the potential for severe weather and even some isolated tornadoes tomorrow in the Central Valley. That's something I'll be following closely. Uh, so thanks, everyone, and I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, please do, if you're interested, on the uh, to get the uh, the... Most recent updates uh, and to be notified when I go live since often I plan it but sometimes it's a little more spontaneous or the timing uh, gets adjusted at the last minute due to current events, uh, please do consider subscribing or uh, signing up for notifications at least via YouTube. That way you'll never miss one uh, even if I pop in unexpectedly. All right, I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.